Welcome back. Now for our first panel session of the day. This is Integrating Just Transition to Net Zero. And here to moderate the panel is Rudolf Duplessis, who is the Green Finance Manager for Carbon Trust in South Africa. Rudolf, welcome and over to you. Thank you, Ralph. Hi, everyone, um, and welcome to our panel discussion on integrating the concepts of a just transition and net zero on the African continent today. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'll now have the pleasure to introduce our panelists, and thereafter we'll uh, handle a number of, of questions um, for, for, um, for your interest. So first up, we have uh, Annika Lund. Um, Annika has, uh, she's an executive for sustainable finance at Standard Bank. Um, Annika has led several instrumental sustainable finance deals across the sub-Saharan Af sub Africa, which has positively contributed towards the development of the sustainable finance market. In her role, she is responsible for driving the right behavior across both client portfolios and within the teams at Standard Bank as it relates to environmental and social impact and mobilizing sustainable finance in the process of doing so. She has been intricately involved in the sustainable finance developments for Standard Bank and Standard Bank clients, as well as forming an integral part for the piloting and testing team for South Africa's green finance taxonomy, which was launched uh, late last year. Uh, second, we have uh, Amali Amin, um, who is the Managing Director and Head of Climate Change at BII, formerly CDC. Um, Amal is, is, is a passionate advocate for sustainable development, and in 2019, she was recognized by Apolitico as one of the top 100 influences on, on climate policy globally. Amali's career over the past 20 years spans the UK government, multilateral development banks, think tanks, impact in, and impact investing contexts. Her professional achievements have been underpinned by a doctorate on policy and finance for commercialization of renewable energy in developing economies. As a managing director of, of BII, she leads teams on climate finance, gender and diversity, investing and technical assistance. Amongst other roles, Emily is also a senior advisor to the UK COP26 presidency and a member of the independent high-level expert group on climate finance and the OECD advisory group on climate and economic resilience and has recently become a trustee of the Born Free Foundation. Quite an impressive resume. Next up, we have Nicole Martins, who's the head of stewardship at the Old Mutual Investment Group. Nicole Martins joined the Old Mutual Investment Group Responsible Investment Team in May 2022. She's responsible for further building Old Mutual Investment Group's renewable uh, RI initiatives, leading to his proactive stewardship, stewardship strategy and further developing Old Mutual Investment Group's listed stewardship service capability. Nicole's passion for sustainable development and developing pragmatic and impactful strategies for Africa's just transition to a low carbon economy in response to the climate emergency is critical to Old Mutual Investment Group's strategy and contribution to the global SDGs. Nicole sits on several working groups and committees such as the Lewis Foundation Climate uh, Risks Analytics for Sustainable Investment Advisory Committee, quite a mouthful, and South Africa UK Partnering for Accelerated Climate Transitions, also known as the UK PAC Program Advisory Group. And the, advice, and the Transparency Task Force. And then last but not least, we have Vicky Sins, who is the Decarbonization and Energy Transition Lead at the World Benchmarking Alliance. So Vicky is responsible for leading the decarbonization of the economy and energy transition, including a just transition for the World Benchmarking Alliance based in Amsterdam. She believes in private sector contribution, responsibility and accountability by demonstrating how companies in high carbon emitting industries are contributing to reaching the goals of the Paris Agreement and SDG 13. Vicky joined the World Benchmarking Alliance in 2019 after spending the past 14 and a half years working for AB and AMRO Bank and the last seven years with AB and AMRO Clearing Bank in charge of energy and commodity clients. She has a master's degree in financial management and is an alumni to the Prince of Wales Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Leadership. In addition to her role at WBA, she also sits on the advisory board of Ever Impact, a platform to measure CO2 emissions. Vicky also serves on the Global Task Force for the Institute of Managed Accountants advising on sustainability related challenges. So as you can see, we have a very knowledgeable panel ahead of us today, and uh, we thought we were not going to make it easy for them. We're going to ask some tough questions. Um, and to maybe start off with, um, I'll pose a question to, to the panel. Um, and I think we'll, we'll um, I'll, I'll take the, uh, the panelists through, through their answers one by one. So to start off with, what does the just transition mean in the South African context and how might it translate into corporate level policy and practice? Quite a tough question. And uh, Nicole, I'm going to throw you in first. Great. Thank you, Rudolf. And thanks again to Carbon Trust for the invitation to be part of this panel. And what an impressive panel. So I'm really honored to be part of this discussion with you. Um, 
when we think about the just transition as old mutual investment group and what does this mean in the south african context it's really all about the the keyword is really on that transition component i think there's been a lot of discussion around where we need to get to we know what the end goal is and we know by when we ideally need to get there now it's about really working with south africa inc to get there in an appropriately ambitious but pragmatic way right so for us, when we think about what does the transition mean for South Africa, it's really about taking uh, appropriately nuanced steps forward. And of course, from you know my perspective and the role that I occupy, it's really about stewarding those companies. We're moving into a new normal. It's something we've not done before. It's a big shift. It's a big change from what we're used to. And so really for me, it's all about staying invested in these companies and helping them through this so really thinking about who are the com what kinds of companies are going to be able to not only take advantage of the shift but are, you're going to make it through in a, a responsible way and those that are not going to make it how do we responsibly take them on that journey right to sort of they are going to be sort of industries ways of doing business that are not going to make it into this new normal so for me when we think about what does the transition mean for south africa it's really about balancing all of that but at the end of the day it's a big opportunity as well i would say when you think what is the South, the transition mean for south africa in the the overarching theme for me is just opportunity to really sort of change our stars uh, if we manage this correctly thank you very much nicole annika can i put you in the hot seat next <laughs> thanks rudolf um yeah i think in the in the south african context we're obviously talking about transitioning from a very strong reliance on fossil fuels to greener forms of energy and in so doing focusing on ensuring the transition is just and equitable which is a whole lot to get right in one go um, i think that it's important when we look at transition policies when we look at transition strategies that we ensure that we're considering everybody you know not regardless of socioeconomic backgrounds we're, we're considering everyone involved everyone needs to benefit from the transition and I think, you know, this can be achieved through creating job opportunities in the green economy, uh, which we've spoken about a lot, uh, which is a theme that comes out a lot in, in the transition um, financing world um, and protecting the income and jobs of those who are currently working in, in these hard to abate sectors. Uh, at a corporate level, I think we should be looking at our own just transition policies. I know there aren't many available in the market. I mean, as a bank, we, we, we're continuously looking out for the developments in the market around just transition. Um, so we don't have a lot of uh, precedents to go to to see how how this what this looks like and how how it works. Um, but at Standard Bank, we are committed to the Paris Agreement in transitioning Africa to a low carbon economy, and we have released a climate policy in. March last year, which says that we would look at um, developing a transition finance product framework uh, and, and we've committed to supporting the just transition through sustainable finance opportunities. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it's obviously something which sits at a national level, but can also be filtered down to corporate or company level in, in ensuring that we're all working towards um, a just transition at the end of the day. Thank you, Annika. Yes, indeed, nuance, very important. And contextualizing is also quite important, I think, when, especially when we think about the social challenges we face in South Africa. Um, Amali, um, just to maybe restate the question. So what does the just transition mean in, South Af in the South African context and how might it translate into corporate level policy and practice? We'd be very keen to hear your views. Uh, I think you might be on, on mute, Amali. Sorry, yes, <laughs> I wasn't sure whether to mute myself or not. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, well, I think first of all, uh, and it's great to be able to join this uh, this panel. And, uh, you know, I think when we look at the issue of the just transition uh, globally, which has now become a very, very topical uh, subject in, in um, all co contexts. Uh, and in fact, it was quite remarkable to see at COP27 how how prominent the focus on just transition has become. But I think it's it's definitely uh, fair to say that South Africa has really been leading uh, the debate and uh, dialogue, particularly at the national level around the just transition. 
and I think has uh, a lot of lessons to share and um, for others to learn from. Uh, we ourselves at uh, BII, I mean, we've been working with uh, TIPS, the Trade and Industrial Policy Strategy um, Think Tank, around uh, just transition finance roadmaps uh, for South Africa, um, but also what this means for other economies, uh, including India, actually. We're looking at how India can learn more from South Africa's experience in that respect. And when, when looking at... Um, the agenda. I mean, it's it's quite remarkable the level of you know very senior level of political attention uh, from the president, uh, and in fact the president's committee on uh, climate change committee that has really placed huge emphasis on this. And I presume that Chris Binova, um has set out that very clearly uh, that that agenda, and the PCC um, you know really uh, is provides a very valuable top-level, top-down steer. But I think perhaps more importantly is the very strong uh, community engagement that has been underway in South Africa. I myself participated in one of the uh, meetings of the PCC um, maybe just uh, almost a year ago now where the just transition uh, was being uh, discussed and it was, uh, you know, Fantastic to see all the communities, um, particularly you know, coming from the Mpumalanga region, talking about uh, the challenges, but also importantly, starting to uh, debate and understand what the opportunities are. And I think from a finance perspective, so uh, we're a development finance institution and, and we look to invest uh, in private sector opportunities and alongside uh, the private sector in South Africa. And for us, it's how do we, uh, how, how, what are the opportunities that we can then finance? And of course, uh, as uh, many will be aware, that a lot of that has been driven by policy and regulation uh, to a certain extent in South Africa. I think other countries are starting to, to follow on that on that front. But I think also very importantly, the role of the financial sector in placing the just transition uh, core to to our businesses and our strategies, I think, is is going to be uh, increasingly important. And so I do think South Africa has a lot to share. Uh, and in terms of leading the challenge uh, around the just transition, both domestically, regionally across the continent, as well as um, globally, uh, it's going to be really um, a, a very important journey for us all to, to engage with and learn from. Thank you very much. And I think, uh, you know, we always talk about the role of government, we talk about the role of, of, of the private sector, but seldomly we talk about the role of communities. And I think that's something critical that we need to reflect on much, much more. Thank you, Emil. Uh, Vicky, last, last up. Um, so what does the just transition mean in the South African context and, and how can corporates respond to this? And I think this is something that you're very well placed to speak to. <laughs> now, I'm, after the first three speakers, uh, they are very experienced in the South African context and, and me talking from a more global perspective, giving also an insight in what actually does it look like. And we, we started as a, a, we're a global NGO looking into what corporate sector accountability actually means when we talk about reaching the sustainable development goals and then we started to develop this just transition methodology and really laying out what are expectations of the private sector of companies when we actually are talking about the just transition we did this in 2021 we launched this at, at cop back then and it was still like also dr amali said really a relatively new concept a company still trying to understand and get their heads together around what is a transition, what does a decarbonization look like, and then adding the social components on, on this. Since then, we've measured 270 companies across four high-emitting sectors, also including some South African companies in the oil and gas sector, electric utility sector, transport sector, and really looking into where are they on this journey. And we see that there is still a big disconnect in companies setting out their decarbonization strategies and then their action to actually identify and prepare uh, and then also mitigate the social impacts of such strategies. I hear, you know, the, in, uh, the, the involvement of communities, the involvement of workers. We believe it starts with laying out a, a, a true just transition plan. And that's in where whichever region you are and the execution and the implications of such plan are different. But it starts with 
uh, several, several steps in a just transition, uh, planning for a just transition. And this can only be informed by really a negotiation through uh, a strong social dialogue, a strong stakeholder engagement, and then also social impact uh, mitigation. So what do we mean with that? We, we strongly believe that you need to, as I said, include your, the potential workers and communities that are impacted by the steps that you have set laid out in your decarbonization strategy, and then set related time-bound targets for the uh, affected workers and affected people, but also your effective relations, right? It is along the value chain. So it is not as easy as just looking at your own business. You need to also have an, have an integrated plan for your, your affected business relations. And then, of course, it's about uh, the, the skills gap and looking into reskilling and upskilling workers. Because, of course, new jobs are not necessarily the jobs that are currently there. How, how are you identifying them and then lay out a plan uh, to, to really look at uh, developing the skills that the workers need for the jobs for the future? And then I think a real important element is the advocacy for the right policy that is needed, right? So companies can be a very strong advocacy for what they actually need in order to create all of this environment that they need to, to successfully execute this. But currently we see that they're still holding back on uh, advocating for the right policies to be in place. Um, and this is not what we say, it's not only the responsibility for the private sector to do this, but it starts with the transparency of, these, of, the, of the private sector to lay out what are the impacts of their decarbonization uh, plans, because only then you can be transparent about what are the actions needed on the social implications of such decarbonization plans. Uh, thank you very much, Vicky. And I think, I think what's, what's also quite, quite interesting that you mentioned is, is that we set these, these plans often well in advance and we so, sometimes struggle to stick to them, but I think we, we often forget that that big master plans are usually uh, iterative, right? So we constantly need to ratchet up our ambition as time goes along and not simply stick to one plan that was made a decade ago. So no, thank you. That's a very valuable contribution. Um, next question is, um, so we've spoken now about, um, you know, the, the broader South African context, but from your experience, what are the learnings from project level interventions and how can corporate net zero strategies do more um, to meet just transition objectives? And very interesting to hear just from your perspectives, what individual projects um, you've you've learned from and and, and what are the, 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 the um, some of the, the recommendations and learnings you can share to, with us from that? Thanks. Uh, and maybe I'll just start off again with, with Nicole. Um, would you mind sharing some of your, your experiences thus far? Sure, I'm happy to. And I mean, it's difficult to think of anything to add after Vicky's great summation of sort of like the main issues. But I do think, you know, from our perspective, because we're listed equity focused, so we're focused on those companies that are listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And when I we look at those companies that are now needing to transition and do so in a, a sort of socially just way, um, I think there's a couple of things that stand out as, as lessons that I think are valuable across industries and across company size. And the first one of those is really about taking, to Vicky's point, around a holistic approach to these things. I think it's really important to emphasize the fact that when we talk about environmental, social and governance issues, those classifications are largely artificial, those sort of uh, silos, and that there is no such thing as a purely environmental, purely social, purely governance issue. They are all infinitely complex and interconnected. So when you are trying to, when we talk about the energy transition, for example, this transition to net zero, to which we've also committed as an organization, while the end goal, that specific target, that metric is provided by an environmental issue strictly, you cannot begin to address it at all costs. You sort of need to start thinking about how are you impacting and being impacted by broader factors. That's one big lesson, I think, for, for all those companies in their transition plans, because if you aren't thinking about that in that holistic, integrated way, you can't even start, right? So you need to be thinking about it as a holistic uh, business strategy issue. And I think uh, to that point, another thing that has been a learning for us is that Obviously, this transition, it's in the name, right? It's a journey and that different companies will be at different levels uh, or different positions in this journey. But really, the way that we could see it is borrowing heavily from something like the Climate Action 100 Plus framework is that 
the first step is really about acknowledging that there is a problem and that you as a corporate, as a project, have some role to play in addressing that. Um, that's really the first step. Once you've got that on board, it's really looking at, all right, well, what is the commitment we make? Right? So what is within our circle of influence? What is a, a appropriately ambitious but realistic commitment for us to make, a target for us to set? And then again, to, to some of the points that have been raised previously around that social uh, conditions, it's around when I'm developing as a company, as a corporate, my plan for addressing this, so for achieving that target or, or meeting that commitment, have I done so in uh, an inclusive way and sort of co-created that with my material stakeholders? Because just like your point, Rudolph, around it's difficult to try and implement a plan that was set 10 years ago without acknowledging that things might shift. It's equally difficult to implement a plan that requires participation from parties that were not consulted when you put the plan together. So I think that's a really big lesson and something that's often overlooked um, when you look at these strategies. And then, I mean, once you're at the point where you've got that plan and you're implementing, it's really just about communicating your progress as you go, making sure that you are agile and able to adjust. I mean, we know that this field is rapidly evolving. The data, the tools, the platforms, the initiatives, the acronyms, there's new ones every day. And you need to be able to think on your feet and to take that into con uh, consideration and to adjust appropriately from all angles. So whether you're a company that's trying to do that, a project that's seeking finance, someone who's trying to finance these things, you really can't be dogmatic in the way you want to to, to approach the issue. So I think those would be some of the sort of key learnings we've got at least from the dealings that we've had on this and trying to help some of the, the bigger companies and smaller ones, but the ones that are listed at least and trying to meet the expectations of a number of different stakeholders. No, fantastic. Thanks, Nicole. And, and you, you tie in really well to Vicky's point um, on, on transparency. Uh, if we, we have these plans in place, we end up implementing projects, we don't communicate our results. Um, it's almost impossible for us to then ratchet up that plan later on to improve it, to fine tune it as we go along. And I think, um, you know, that's that's something that needs to be stressed. Um, we can make firm commitments and, and, and you know, communicate our, our results every now and then. But if we aren't absolutely transparent in those, um, we are we are at risk of, of potentially losing a lot of gains that could have been made. Annika, do you have any, any specific project level learnings that you can share with us today? I think there are some valuable lessons that um, can be taken out of project level interventions. Um, we've referred to this quite a bit already, but engaging local communities is, is really key um, in ensuring an equitable transition. That's, that's really very clear. So I think um, a lot of the learnings really come back to um, that that level of engagement. So firstly, I think training and job opportunities, I think I've mentioned that before. Um, secondly, I think it's important to assess the impact um, on communities uh, and to ensure that it's addressed through the mitigation measures that are being, being um, pursued. I think um, corporate net zero strategies could be designed to ensure that um, the benefits of the transition are shared amongst all shareholders, um, including the local communities, not only those that are directly involved in these projects. And I think lastly is, is around incentives um, for corporate net zero strategies to provide incentives for the adoption of renewable energy sources and the development of, of green infrastructure. I think that, that, that can really drive the uptake of, of these strategies. Um, so really kind of themed around um, community impact, training, job opportunities, um, and, in, and, in, and incentives, um, some of the, the key valuable lessons that have come out of, uh, out of those interventions. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, that's, that, that's uh, lead us in, leads us into the, 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 our next uh, speaker. Amal, do you have any, any uh, project level interventions that you can share with us today? And, um, I think I think it's, it's it's quite refreshing to hear um, those in the financial sector also speaking about the social interventions and how that can be integrated into our environmental work. And I think it's it's critical for where we are at this at this stage of our our development in South Africa. So keen to hear what what um, views you may be able to share. Yeah. So I mean, obviously, obviously, as a development finance institution, we we place have always placed a lot of emphasis on the sort of social development dimension um, of all our investing. Uh, but we actually uh, set, um, when we developed our climate strategy back in uh, 2020, which we, we launched in 2020, we actually placed just transition as one of our 
core three pillars. So we have a pillar on net zero, um, a pillar on adaptation and resilience, and then uh, a sort of cross-cutting, but the third pillar is also around just transition. And the reason we did this is because um, we uh, always look at the number of jobs that we create through our investments as a as one indication of a positive development um, impact. So uh, it seemed to us to make sense to, to prioritize the focus on just transition. And when we've, as we've looked to implement that, um, we've taken, uh, I suppose initially the focus was more around the transition in to the uh, net zero climate resilient development pathways. So uh, looking at those opportunities, uh, looking at how we could, we're investing in, uh, for example, um, a renewable energy equity platform in, in India, where we provided also a lot of training, uh, upskilling for women in particular to to be able to get you know, relatively um, sort of senior technical jobs within that renewables industry, utility scale renewables. So this was so the initial focus, this sort of focus on the transition in, but of course the transition out uh, is where some of the risks uh, need to be more effectively addressed. And um, we started to innovate a bit there. And I just wanted to fully agree with the points that were made earlier, in particular, I think uh, Nicole's point that um, you know we really need to integrate just transition into our broader um, frameworks and ESG in particular, it shouldn't be seen as an add-on. It needs to be fully mainstream and integrated, whilst recognizing there may need to be a particular, um, you know, set of uh, areas of focus and and uh, bringing out the 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 importance of just transition when you know taking projects to investment committees. Um, but uh, one one area that we started to look at was um, looking at some investments in uh, the fossil fuel sector. I think there was one particular project we were looking at that um, uh, heavy fuel oil that we were looking to exit uh, from that because it, you know we were looking to exit in any case, and we were starting to um, identify what could we do as part of our exit strategy to to encourage that uh, company to actually uh, work with local communities and ensure workers had um, you know a good good sort of. Uh, um, uh, sort of uh, process for managing any um, you know loss of jobs related to the closure of that plant. Um, now this I think is you know it's quite quite challenging. It's new. It's um, something I think we still have some way to go, but uh, it seems to be you know very much the the direction of travel. That as you know, how do we integrate this within to what we're already doing on the ESG uh, context? Fantastic. Thank you very much. Vicky, finally, can we um, reflect on, on some of your project level experiences? I know WBA has done fantastic work in terms of establishing metrics and measures for, for transition, and we'd be very keen to, to hear your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. And it is it is very interesting to hear others uh, reflect on this as well, because I think what, what I want to highlight for, for this specific point is that um, we're not just looking for a, a, a reference on just transition itself, right? We want to really make sure that the content of the plan and the content of the execution is is resulting in a just and equitable transition and often that we, that's why we need to look at a very detailed level of what actually is being addressed in a project or in a specific region or, or by a specific sector or company and i think in this instance it has to also start with a basic level of it was already referenced the esg but the social elements have to fight. and i think that is where we've also seen that there is still a big gap because there are minimum level criteria that have already been set out by the UN guiding principles on uh, uh, providing decent work, uh, assessing human rights. And there we still see, although these, these guiding principles have been in place for, for a decade, there is still a big gap in addressing those. And I think on top of that, we're looking into just an equitable transition, but we also do not need to forget that those basic principles need to be in place. And what we've seen that in level of instances when addressing a just transition, we're also looking at green and decent creation, right? We we want to, that that is part of 
and uh, 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 transitioning into the new future. But there is this that a lot of the new jobs that are being created are not necessarily good jobs. And I think that is something that needs to be kept right front and center in, 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 in I've heard Dr. Amalie saying in transitioning out to say where we're transitioning into that needs to also follow these basic principles of being at providing decent work for these for the workers and the community. I think one last thing I want to say is what we really see as as a positive is that there is go there is more and more cross sectoral collaboration. Right, we see that there is this need to look beyond your own sector for these new jobs, where we see cooperation between the traditional fossil fuel companies with the new renewable energy companies with some of the mining industry companies with providing renewable energy and i think that is where uh, what the next uh, uh, level of 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 projects and 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 really addressing sort of these these a lot of these just transition elements in is that when you plan for your decarbonization strategies the element about you know the new jobs and reskilling of upskilling of workers there needs to be also cooperation outside of your own company because not all company or not all displaced workers potentially can be found a new job in your own uh, organization hence there is the need to look beyond uh, different sectors and that touches on a very critical point that we're facing in South Africa at the moment, where uh, we see a massive diversification in future of our energy system. And we cannot expect one single utility to provide the employment in future. Um, and I guess another another question that also another point that you raised that also um, resonated with me was, uh, do we create jobs for the sake of creating jobs or, and, or are those jobs sustainable and long lasting? And I think if you really truly plan to address social issues in, in a country like South Africa or on the African continent more broadly, we need to look at decent jobs and not just jobs. So um, final question, um, just to maybe start with you, Nicole. With, with you, Nicole. Um, uh, so going beyond national policy, what can be done to encourage and enable corporates to pursue ambitious and just net zero strategies? And what challenges um, do corporates face? Uh, it'd be very interesting to hear what uh, experiences corporates um, have had and what, do, what are the things that, that corporates that wish to embark on a sustainable, sustainability journey need to look out for in terms of the challenges and pitfalls that, that lie on the road? Yeah, thanks, Rudolf. Uh, I do think that we've touched on a couple of these already. I mean, there's going to be the usual suspects that will come up, or you know, there'll be this whole uh, this, the idea of data and technologies that you need, and um, how do you prioritize or balance between sort of the environmental and the social targets like that kind of thing and we've touched on the need for engagement which i think is really important so that the challenges component i might park for now because i think we have addressed a lot of that but i think when it comes to what do the corporates of south africa need to be thinking about in developing their transition strategies and i do think it's a core component now of your business strategy it's really i mean from the perspective of a long-term investor we are very carefully examining where we're putting money right now because we are, as I say, long-term institutional investors. Our timeline is, you know, it's not three or five years, it's 10, 20, 30 years. We're looking at, do you have a plan to still be a going concern at that time, right? So as a corporate, it's not a nice to have, it's not something that you can leave for the next CEO or a farm out to a consultant. You really need to take this on board. It's a tour to your business strategy. But one of the things that I would encourage corporates to do in developing this strategy is to focus on real world impact, right? One of the things that's very easy to do when we talk about transitioning to net zero, for example, um, it's very easy to do that on paper. So from an investment perspective, if we want to get our portfolio to net zero, there's very quick and easy ways to do that on paper. And that's to sort of kick out any of the high emitters. Uh, or to just heavily invest in offsets. And on paper, we've achieved our target and that looks great for us, but we've changed nothing in the real world, right? We've not made any of that difference like you were saying about maybe we've created jobs, maybe we've decreased emissions, but it's on a spreadsheet, it's not in the real world. So we haven't actually addressed the problem. So for me, I think as a corporate that's hoping to navigate the space and develop a strategy that makes sense and that is actually viable and resilient, you need to be thinking about what is the real world impact of the strategy. So uh, what is the impact that this, these decisions that I make have 
beyond and how am I going to be impacted in real terms by what's happening around me? So I think if you're focusing on it like that, instead of looking at it as an obligation or a compliance burden, some sort of grudge purchase, really think about um, how are the decisions that we're making? How is the strategy that I'm developing affecting the sustainability, the stability and the resilience, not only of my company, but of the market in which I'm expected to operate? I think you'll already be starting to think about this in a much more um, realistic and a much more impactful way. And, and, and doing so might fly counter to, to what some of your stakeholders might want. You know, if, if they're asking you for sort of quick turnaround, they want you to just copy paste the framework or, um, you know, quickly agree to some sort of target in your an, uh, integrated annual reports. And it's very tempting to rainbow wash or green wash and sort of say, oh, no, of course, we'll get to that. Of course, we'll do that because everyone else is saying they'll do it. I think focus on what is the real world impact of what I'm doing. And that way you build a, a, a strategy that is really uh, robust. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Thanks, Nicole. I mean, that's 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 a critical question. And that's also something that we always try and raise awareness of that climate change is around the corner. And if we keep thinking in, in, in silos, um, we, we purely focus on our own sector, there might not be that much to to do uh, if, if, if we're too late. So um, no, thank you very much for that. Annika, um, do you have any specific views that you could share with us? So what what challenges do corporates face uh, when it comes to going on this on this journey? Yeah, I think challenges, um, Nicole's re referred to the usual suspects. I think um, those are still the key challenges. Um, so lack of access to data and information on your carbon footprint um, as a bank, something which we're also busy um, dealing with and, and looking at, you know, very hard to put targets in place um, for your scope three emissions when you don't know what your current position is. Um, I think there's a lack of public-private partnership. So if we look at the the benefits um, that we can gain from public-private partnerships um, in the form of blended finance, um, if you look at examples such as the debt for nature swaps in Belize last year, where um, government insured the the bond that was raised, and um, you know the, the the important role that um, the, the government played in in, in um, advancing the, the the funding through through the debt capital markets, um, you know that more of that needs to be done. I think, and more more of those types of um, partnerships can can really unlock uh, and progress the sustainable finance market. But also, when you look at public private partnerships, we're talking about um, environmental strategy and project development. So, you know, municipalities working with um, communities to develop energy efficiency projects. And this, there are some examples of this in, 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 in Africa, where communities have really invested and bought into the idea of energy efficiency with the help of the municipalities and some funding, and they really feel like they own it and it works because they understand it and they, they, they it's something which they've also contributed towards building out. Um, I, I think, you know, Yes, the cost of, of renewable energy has has reduced significantly, and um, Dr. Oliver referred to the fact that that's the cheapest form of energy at the moment. But I think it is still seen as a high cost of um, or a high cost to transition to greener technologies. Obviously, there's a high cost initially or upfront, um, but over the long term, um, it, it it will yield a lot more benefits. I think it's getting over that that thinking um, of the high cost barrier. Um, and then I think lastly, you know, probably around what is the, it, it is fairly clear to see what's going to happen up until let's say 2030, beyond that to 2050, what are the green technologies that we're going to be, be looking at and what, what will be the, avail the availability of, of those green technologies. Um, so, so that those are some of the, the, I think kind of challenges, um, we're facing and discussing when, when we're looking at, at this transition. Yeah, no, thanks, Annika. You, you provided us with some challenges, but also some solutions. So uh, public-private partnerships and innovative financing is what will um, enable us to, to, to undertake this transition and also potentially prepare us for what technologies might be around the corner. That was very valuable. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Emily, from your perspective as a DFI, how, how do you um, perceive the challenges faced by corporates and, and what, what can corporates do? Yeah, so I think, I mean, I think everything that's just been said, I fully, fully agree with because, yeah, so we're looking at how investors, you know, long-term investors, 
um, uh, are starting to set uh, their own transition plans to net zero, um, it, it's becoming increasingly clear that corporates will need to be able to provide the necessary um, data and reporting to demonstrate that they are able to fit within these uh, portfolios uh, that are increasingly aligning to net zero. And so, um, of course, then, um, you know, the just transition dimension, whilst it's not yet fully recognized as core to ESG, but certainly in, it seems to be the direction of travel. And I think in South Africa, in addition to government leadership, I mean, the role of um, the financial sector, the stock exchange in uh, integrating just transition into reporting, um, of course, initiatives like the World Benchmarking Alliance um, also being very valuable in that context. So, I mean, all of this additional scrutiny and transparency, I think it's it's becoming increasingly clear, clear that corporates will need to uh, place just transition as you know pretty much part of their uh, core to their strategies um, to really raise the uh, capital that will be needed. Um, but I think what more could be done, I think uh, there is, uh, it'd be great to see some corporate just transition bonds uh, start to be put out, you know, to really um, uh, sort of demonstrate to the market what exactly this means. And, uh, you know, I think for corporates that are very energy intensive, that may be very reliant on fossil fuels, um, but where we know there is potential to transition. And I think particularly some of the, you know, the big industrial sectors, I think could be really, really interesting, uh, interesting ways of raising capital to actually enable the just transition from, you know, high carbon to low or, or net zero consistent um, carbon uh, uh, business models and value chains as well. So I'm thinking, you know, whether steel industry, um, cement uh, sector, you know, the, the we know the technologies are emerging, there will be higher price, uh, higher cost of those technologies in, in many, many respects. But, you know, there may well also be some opportunities for, you know, uh, sustainability or sustainability linked pricing, which can bring in the just transition dimension within that context. Um, I'm a big, big fan, as I think you read my bio of sustainable development. So, and sustainable development is social, economic, and environmental coming together. And I think that's where we need to be using uh, financial instruments to help uh, further uh, attract and catalyze uh, and move move sectors and corporates along, uh, you know, on on their journeys. No, thank you, Amali. That's that's very valuable. I mean, we we often have the question of of transition bonds and what that might look like, and it's encouraging mm -hmm. to see that some South African corporates, um, thinking of Angler specifically, who have raised the social bond from IFC mm -hmm. to help with the just transition related initiatives, is is really an encouraging step. So I think for the African continent, marrying international best practice with with contextual needs is really what's critical. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, DFI, such as yourself, play a critical role in disseminating those experiences. Um, Vicky, last last um, uh, one on the, the panel, but but not least. So, um, from from your perspective, working very closely with corporates, um, what are what are the challenges they face, and and what encouraging signs have you seen in overcoming that? Yeah, I think just as a, as a basic principle, and what corporates would like to see, of course, is an enabling policy and finance environment in the end, right? Whatever they do, they want to feel supported that policy and regulation will follow and that finance will flow to support the plans that they have. And I think a lot has been said about data availability already. I think the big challenge is indeed this, this need to increase data transparency, right? We will see that, that there will be more regulation coming uh, and I think the first step will be on uh, really doubling down on uh, credible transition plans. And that starts with really integrating time-bound, long-term, medium, short-term uh, transition plans. And I think that needs to be backed up by financial scenario planning. All the tools are there. You can do that sectoral, you can do that regional. So there is no from our perspective, no uh, excuse to not be transparent and, and, and really do the scenario planning uh, for your respective sector and region, because that will then allow to really uh, 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 let investments flow and support financial uh, solutions, whether that's public-private partnership, whether that is 
through whatever bonds or other solutions that we have. But it, it can only happen if that transparency is there on what is, is needed in order to, to support that real eco economy change. And I think one of the clear message that we, we want to send as well with through our alliance is that, uh, and, and what we've aimed to do yesterday, we 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 have an, an investor statement out signed by 54 um, large financial institutions giving a clear signal, for example, to the oil and gas industry saying, you need to start a doubling down on your decarbonization efforts. And that needs to go hand in hand with the Just Transition Plan. Having that statement out there, really signals not only to the listed equity and listed companies but gives a wide international financial sig signal to all companies whether it's state-owned private-owned they're all reliant in the end on also international financial markets that this is a very high priority for uh, letting investments and finance flow and i think that is just one example to really show that companies can go tr more transparent that's how we can highlight leadership we can share learnings in regions, in, in in across sectors, but also in the end, hold uh, private sector to account if there is a lack of really, uh, yeah, uh, in, uh, helping to support the the deliverables of the of the SDGs. No, thank you very much, Vicky. I think what what we what we need to to really keep in mind over the next few years, which are critical, is that we don't just need sectoral change; we need systemic change, and I think having a set level of metrics that we can use to actually assess the performance of our of our industries across continents across economies is what we will need and i think the, the wba plays a, a very um, encouraging role in that regard so um yeah thank you very much um colleagues we we don't have much time left for q a um we we were planning on taking some some questions from the panel but um the the, the discussions um ended up being so fruitful and interesting that we uh we, we ran a bit over time but I want to thank all of you very much for your participation and for sharing your um, very insightful views. And um, we hope to see you on various platforms again, having similar conversations as they evolve. Um, and we'd like to just close off by, um, by saying thanks.